Merci. So, so I thank you all for coming out on what um, certainly feels like one of the warmest nights of the year. No matter how, how often you enjoy wine, education is such a, a critical component um, of the wine experience. You can ask vignerons this, you can ask sommeliers this, you can ask servers, you can ask aficionados, you can ask newbies. Um, if you don't learn, if you're not always learning, you're not enjoying wine to its fullest potential. Um, and when you're doing it in a group of people, what better way to enjoy and celebrate education with, with other people looking to celebrate that, that same region, that same education, that same experience. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and so this is kind of the overview that we're looking to take um, with this new program. So here we are at Seminar 1, The Tastes of Bordeaux. This is going to give you a, an overview of the region. Um, we'll dip a little bit into history. We do have a, a shorter amount of time here. Honestly, I, we could probably spend, I mean, there's an, this is an entire organization founded upon Bordelais wines. We could spend far more than an hour doing this. Um, but we're going to try to limit ourselves and our, in our revelry and our passion um, for Seminar 1. Seminar 2, the quality of Bordeaux, top to bottom. It's important to see Bordeaux not just from the very lofty heights um, that it often achieves, but also from the ground floor and understanding what caused, you know, really this global surge of Bordelais wine. Why is it important? Why is it critical to the wine market? Um, then we get down to the regions of Bordeaux. Here we're going to start to dig in a little bit into the terroir, a little bit into the communes, um, a little bit into what really makes these wines so unique. Why does Saint-Emilion taste different from Pomerol? Why does Poyac differ from saint Estef? Um, so some things to look forward to as we kind of start to develop this program, but here we are tonight starting at the beginning. Um, so a little bit, again, kind of Eric uh, alluded to me, um, and this is just a summary of what I've done in the wine world. It looks impressive, but I've spent a lot of money on education, and somehow that kind of helps you get where you're going. Um, but also some pretty cool places like Espalier, uh, Settle the Terre, which used to be around in Boston, sadly. Um, I do have a culinary degree. I worked at Hammersley's Bistro. I apparently have a habit of working for places that close down shortly after I work there. I guess I'm not getting hired by restaurants anytime soon, but some educational roles with Treasury Wine Estates and Jackson Family Wines. Uh, so really I've seen kind of the evolution and the growth of wine um, from the grower, from the workers out in the fields all the way to the dining room table. Um, so if you have questions tonight, I definitely want to encourage them. If I don't get to your questions, um, I will be around for the entire evening. I will try to make it around. I know we have a, a wonderful dinner after this. So I want to make sure that your questions do get asked. So if I don't get to your questions, please just jot it down. I'll try to come around and uh, you can flag me down at some point. I want to make sure everyone gets the education they're looking for. So here we are, France, um, a country that we all love and respect um, in terms of the wine culture and heritage. And you look at this tiny little corner of France that we've devoted so much of our time and energy to, and that is Bordeaux. Um, we think of Bordeaux, again, it's the second largest wine region in France in terms of volume. It's the largest in terms of acreage um, under vine. Um, and when you look at it, the total land mass is about half of Rhode Island. So wouldn't that be cool just to like kind of wake up one day and drive down to Rhode Island, get past, uh, get past uh, Pawtucket and get into Providence and then just see vines stretched as far as you can see. That's essentially what we have here in Bordeaux. Um, tucked right up against the Atlantic coast. It's a huge region. Um, and again, there's a lot of different styles that come out of here and we won't touch on all of them today, unfortunately, but uh, we will get a pretty good overview of the quality that does exist. So what is it? Where is it? Why does it matter? Bordeaux, very simply put in French, board, near or next to, and eau, water. It's right on the Atlantic coast. Um, so it really makes sense that this was kind of the, the, the term that caught, you know, kind of caught the attention of the world. You know, the British always had certainly a ton of influence here um, throughout history. So it was more a reference to where it was located rather than its more traditional name of Aquitaine, which also has a reference to the water. Maritime climate, obviously. Um, this is critically important, especially in vintages. Um, you know, unfortunately, this vintage, 2017, um, the maritime climate wasn't able to save all of the sins of Mother Nature, so to speak. Um, because of, you know, we, we all know the Cape and the islands, when you go in the summer, it's a little bit cooler. Um, and then in the wintertime, it's always just a little bit warmer. It doesn't quite have the drastic extreme fluctuation in climate like you might see further inland, in places like Burgundy or Alsace or the Rhone Valley. Again, the Atlantic Ocean causes a little bit more coolness in the summer, but also gives it a little bit more warmth in the winter times, giving it a longer growing season. Um, but there is a bit of humidity as well. And we have two enormous rivers here um, flowing into the Gironde. Uh, the Garonne and the Dordogne, you can kind of see down here, another moderating influence. So it's all about water here. It's all about really the exposure to water that gives it, again, a unique opportunity that a lot of other wine regions throughout Europe, and especially, not, uh, especially in France, an opportunity that uh, a lot of other regions don't enjoy. 
So a quick tour of history here. Uh, sixth century, uh, sixth century BC, this is when the first signs of winemaking started taking place. Albeit it's not the traditional winemaking that we see of, it's mainly uh, the Phoenicians and a lot of the Mediterranean cultures that were kind of sailing around and planting vines and just basically not necessarily using it exclusively for consumption, but also for medicinal purposes, sometimes for distillation later on um, as we get kind of into the, the early Middle Ages. Um, and then we get into 1152, the, the wedding of Eleanor of Aquitaine to Henry Plantagenet. Uh, this has always been a very, very sensitive spot in terms of the Franco and Anglo relations. Um, a lot of weddings were set up back then to basically preserve your dynasty, preserve your empire, and hopefully expand a little bit. Um, so the British and the French always were looking at Bordeaux. They were always looking at this area as a place where they could get together and really compromise. However, that led to uh, some kind of unrest and unsettlement, uh, the Hundred Years' War, uh, which was basically the French kicking the British out of mainland Europe, simply put. Uh, this lasted well over 100 years. It was, uh, it was brutal, um, but what you really had was the French saying, au revoir, go back to your island. We don't need you in our territory anymore. We have our own kingdom to run here. Uh, 17th century. This is where winemaking really starts to take hold in terms of the quality that we see today. Again, we go back to the 6th century BC, however, it's the Dutch. And this is often overlooked throughout most of history because the Dutch have never been known as really fine connoisseurs of wine or great grape growers. Um, but what they were really good at was construction, uh, was good at mitigating floodlands, uh, was also really good at distillation. So the Dutch saw Bordeaux and they saw potential here. And they, they, the Dutch were, they played a huge role in draining a lot of the marshland. If we went back to that map, you can see again, it's right, you know, basically all this land, once upon a time, was marshland, fair, fairly uninhabitable. But the Dutch came in and saw, well, we can help you. We can help you with drainage. We can make sure we dig ditches. We can run these canals right to the river. So you can actually start to build on these properties. And then they started to see more vineyard land popping up. The Dutch also set a lot of prices in the international market. They bought a lot of the, the Bordeaux wine, uh, what was called Bordeaux wine at the time, for distillation back uh, in, in the Netherlands. And that was going to become Genever or gin. Uh, kind of some of the earliest days of gin in the 16th, 17th centuries uh, was based upon distillation of Bordeaux wine. So again, hugely important. This is where the Dutch got most of their raw product from. So even though it wasn't quite the standards that we think of today in terms of quality, it was some of the most sought after grape varietals for distillation. Again, times have changed. Thomas Jefferson, we give a lot of attribution about, uh, to Thomas Jefferson because of his influence and discovering a lot of wines. Most recently, with a lot of historical research, uh, we're starting to unearth that Thomas Jefferson maybe was not quite the saint, uh, patron saint of Bordeaux that we all want him to be, and it might actually have been John Adams, which is kind of cool for us, you know, being in Massachusetts, uh, you know, having a, a local, a native son actually be a more, more of a promoter of Bordeaux. Um, but Thomas Jefferson in 1807 uh, uh, was actually in a big proponent of a nationalist treaty um, that shut off a lot of export of wine to the United States. They went from 22, uh, sorry, 22 million bottles uh, down to about 7 million bottles a year. Uh, so cut the production in by a third, which really, really crippled the Bordeaux wine industry. So again, we're kind of starting to learn a little bit more about this. More diaries and papers are being unearthed. Um, but we might want to start to twinge, you know, kind of tweak the way we think about Thomas Jefferson uh, for the moment. And again, it all comes back really to the British support throughout history. When they weren't fighting each other, when they weren't trying to, you know, kind of conquer one or the other, uh, you, know, set, you know, sailing their ships around the world, you know, planting their flag in the ground, saying this is for king and country, um, they were celebrating the wine. The British have always loved Bordeaux wine. Um, and now, finally, they've started actually being able to grow grapes in the British Isles a little bit. Um, but really, it's all about finding wine that suited their palate, and this, this idea of claret, this idea of a blended wine that just you know, was ethereal and wonderfully nuanced and complex. Um, they really wrapped their mind around, they, wrapped, they opened their wallets up for. So, the British were certainly a huge influence one way or the other. We'll see Chateau in a lot of these bottles. And again, this might be a little basic for some of you, but others I know are just starting their journey, so we want to make sure we cover all the, the, uh, the terminology you might see on the label, but what does it mean? What does Chateau actually mean when you actually see it on a bottle of wine? Well, first of all, it's a very different way of winemaking that a lot of people will profess right now. If you go to a region like Burgundy, or maybe it's, uh, you go to Napa Valley, there's a lot of talk about single vineyards. Um, again, it's just a philosophy that the vineyard is the most important piece of the winemaking process. Sure, in Burgundy, it's a little bit more diverse. You're dealing with a slope. It's a little bit trickier in terms of getting ripeness. Yeah, so vineyards will actually matter a whole lot more. In Bordeaux, it's about who manages your vines. It's about the ownership of that property. Because if you have somebody that owns a plot of land and they don't know what they're doing, they can take amazing fruit um, and they can turn it into something that's not necessarily amazing at all, something that's horrible. 
Um, but if you have a great ownership of maybe a mediocre vineyard, and they cultivate it, and they care for it, and they give it the, the love, and they nurture it, um, then all of a sudden you, be, you have something that's greater than it used to be. So it really is about know-how and experience here, and which is why we see a lot of family ownership, and um, why we see a lot of, you know, again, these, these chateaus that were set up two, three, four hundred years ago, still in existence, and still being carried on by the same traditions, same families um, that started them way back when. I mean, it, it's a little bit about branding here. You know, we in the United States here, we're kind of brand junkies. We all know what's, you know, what, who makes your phone? Everybody knows that, right? Apple, Samsung. What kind of car do you drive? We all know that. This is the same kind of idea in Bordeaux. We're talking about brands. We're talking about places and people we can trust. And that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different because when we talk about quality, when we talk about vintages, we want to assume that the best quality is going to be produced no matter what by the best people, the people with the best know-how. So we get to a little bit of winemaking here. Again, we're kind of plowing through this um, quickly, but it's important to realize that Bordeaux makes wine a very unique style. Um, and again, it's, a lot of it does involve new oak. One thing that Bordeaux has always had a lot of throughout history is money. And what a new oak barrel, who can fathom a guess of what that costs in the open market right now? 900 euro, probably closer to 11, 1200 euro now in some, for some of the top coopers. Um, from some of the top fours. We're now getting into terroir of forests now. Um, but you know, we're talking about an average price of $4 per bottle that you're spending just on oak. That's a lot of money to spend on oak, especially if you are trying to basically turn your wine over quickly, uh, if you're trying to you know, really work on thin margins. Oak is something you can't really afford. Um, the other thing is time. How long does an average bottle of Bordeaux sit in the chateau, high quality Bordeaux? Maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe three years, some even four. Time is money. Time is space in your chateau, in your wine cellar. A lot of people say, just get it out and sell it. I need the cash flow. Some properties say, our wine isn't ready. Our wine needs to mature. Our wine needs to rest. The challenge is we have the variable weather. Certainly, weather is always a big deal no matter what we're talking about because uh, in the wine world, it's an agricultural product. We can't lose sight of that. We're growing fruit. Weather's, Mother Nature, I mean, if everyone's kept, you know, again, we see frost, we see hail throughout most of Europe. We see Napa Valley just spike to about 108 degrees yesterday and into today. Um, it's something to deal with. I mean, again, Bordeaux being right on the Atlantic, it's very, it, it moderates it. But we do have a lot of fog, a lot of wind, a lot of rain. That can put it, you know, give you certainly some challenges. Humidity equals mold. We'll talk about this a little bit by 99% of the time, mold is a bad thing. Mold is a very bad thing. It can ruin your crop. There's, no, there's some chemicals you can use. They don't always work. It can devastate an entire vineyard. Mold's a problem, which is why we need to deal with really hardy grape varieties. So finally, we're going to talk. This is more of kind of an eye chart for you just to look at for those who are looking at vintages and like, well, I've heard about this vintage. Um, all of these will be available um, to email out. I'll make sure that Eric has a copy of this and we can distribute this. Um, but for those of you who are looking to collect, here's just kind of, uh, you know, kind of your best uh, you know, your top, uh, your, you know, your top 15 and since 1961. Um, you know, we've been blessed with a couple of great vintages in the last decade or so in Bordeaux. There's a lot of consistency that you don't have to worry about again. Um, in other regions, um, you know, it's a little bit more challenging, the highs and lows. But again, you look at this, a lot of wine regions would love to have this kind of pedigree, this kind of legacy to be able to pass on. So let's talk a little bit about the region here. And then we'll start getting into tasting wines, because that's, I think, why we're all here. So again, here's our region of Bordeaux, again, the landmass of Rhode Island, from the Gironde in the north, uh, moving south, kind of moving south, the Dordogne, off to the north, the Gironde to the south. Big landmass in the middle here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about these regions as we move forward, but let's talk first about grape varietals. Cabernet Sauvignon for reds, Merlot. Merlot is actually the most widely planted grape varietal in all of Bordeaux. Most people want you to kind of think the Cabernet is the, is the lead horse here. But it's more prestigious, it's a little bit more temperamental. Merlot does very, very well in wet soils. Again, we talked about water a lot. We talked about the ocean, we talked about rivers, we talked about marshland, we talked um, uh, a lot about draining these, these areas. But there's a lot of clay um, where Merlot succeeds. And what is clay? It's something that's moist, it's cool, help it to, it retains water. Merlot loves to have its feet wet. I love to kind of refer to it that way. Cabernet Sauvignon hates having its feet wet. It loves dry soil. It loves gravelly soil, stony soil. When it rains, Cabernet likes to have it just go straight through, down, so it can actually find the water when it wants it, as opposed to just having it thrust upon its rootstock. White wines. Again, a lot of people start to think about Bordeaux, and they don't get to experience white wines. Um, it's a shame, because some of the white wines of Bordeaux are some of the, some of the most amazing white wines in the entire world, full stop. 
and there are some great white wines to just enjoy on warm summer days as well. Um, but we talk about Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. So these, again, are grape varietals that are very aromatic. They're very fresh. They're very high in acid. Um, they love having this kind of diversity of soil. They tend to prefer chalk, limestone, or a mix thereof. Um, but they can thrive even in gravel as well. You know, these kind of soils that give you a lower pH, um, Sauvignon Blanc th you know, thrives in. Because it's such a high acid grape variety, it needs something to help cut that out a little bit. And then at the bottom, you see actually some blending varietals for both red and white. Red varietals, you see things like Carmenere, Mer uh, Malbec, Petit Verdot, whites, Muscadel, Colombard, Merlot Blanc, Sauvignon Gris, and Uni Blanc. You often don't see these, certainly not as a lead role. Carmenere is nearly extinct in Bordeaux. Petit Verdot, five, maybe six percent in some wines. It's a very spicy grape varietal. Malbec we see a ton of, just not in Bordeaux. We see it in Argentina, we see it down in Cahors, um, we see it in other regions, kind of in the south, uh, southwest of France. But Bordeaux has kind of always seen it as more of an accessory varietal as more of a dominant varietal. So moving forward here, um, here's kind of the guidelines to play with um, when you look at your dry wines versus your sweet wines. Uh, your dry white wines will be mainly based on Sauvignon Blanc. It is the more noble grape varietal. It is the more aromatic grape varietal. Semillon provides a really laser-like backbone, um, a lot of acidity, a lot of minerality, whereas Sauvignon Blanc provides a lot of floral, a lot of tropical, a lot of really high citrus tones. And they work really well together. Your sweet white wines, it's reversed. So Semillon takes the lead dog role, and Sauvignon play, Blanc plays a little bit more of a backseat role. Because when you're talking about sweet wines, we're talking about something called botrytis that settles in, um, which is this gnarly stuff. Um, you look at this, and it's a brave, brave person that decided that they looked at this grape, that grape right there and said, I can make wine out of that. That looks delicious. <laughs> when this grape is sitting right there, it's like, no, that's not, that's not quite for me. I want, I want these gnarly ones right in here um, that are rotten and look like raisins on the vine. Semillon is a, uh, is a fairly uh, thin-skinned grape varietal, high amounts of acid. So this mold sets in. This is called Botrytis cinerea, um, the noble rot. So while I talked about a lot of rot being bad at the outset, this is the one rot that is actually great. Um, this, this is one of those things that Mother Nature created, and you're like, how on earth did somebody come up with this idea? How did, this, how did everything come together perfectly to make one, again, kind of the most luxurious dessert-style wines out there? Again, very, very bold thinking. So uh, semillon, high acid, this, this bowl dehydrates a grape essentially from the inside out. It sets on the grape, it set, filaments start to burrow in, they go in, they basically dehydrate the grape, so what you're left with looks like a raisin, a really moldy raisin. But you have increased sugar, you have increased acidity, and you have concentration of flavors. It takes a lot longer to ferment because you have so much sugar, but when you taste it, it's all imbalanced. It's perfect. It's got acid, it's got sweet, it's got these wonderful mushroomy notes, it's got saffron and ginger and exotic spices. That is only because of this mold. Semillon by itself doesn't taste like a lot on its own. It tastes kind of like, like lemon, like high acid lemon water. Um, but this makes it something far more complex. So here when we talk about our white wines, we're going to talk mainly about uh, this region of Pesac Leonion, which sits to the south and southeast of the Cité de Bordeaux. Um, Pesac Leonion uh, created an appellation created in the 1950s. That was the highest uh, quality appellation for white wine. Um, then you have Grave, uh, the larger appellation, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of north to south. Then you have Ceron, Barsac, and Sauternes in yellow here, which are your traditional sweet wine appellations. But that being said, let's pick up a glass, because I think this is the important thing to do right now, um, and start tasting some wine. So wines one and two, I want everyone to kind of look at right now. And I'll actually go back to this in a second. So wines one and two. It's on your tasting sheet, um, but also I'll have the wines up here, so you don't need to keep looking down. But if you do want to take notes on your sheet, please do. Um, just be sure that uh, whoever uh, turns in their, uh, their kind of answers on the back of their tasting sheet um, is okay with actually parting with it for a little bit. We'll try to get it back to you for sure. Um, but wine number one, Chateau Bonnet, uh, Entre du Mer. And wine number two, Chateau Fusel from Pessac Léonion. So we chose these two wines, uh, one to kind of give you an exhibit of freshness and liveliness. Um, Sauvignon Blanc dominated uh, for Chateau Bonnet. You know, it is 50%, but 40% uh, Semillon. Very fresh, very lively, very ar aromatic. So we'll go back to our kind of profile here. These are meant to put ideas in your head. These are meant to kind of be a guideline for what you're tasting. Some of you will be more attuned to what you know, kind of your, your senses are telling you. Some of you stick your nose in this glass of wine and go, I smell wine. And that's totally cool. Because again, no one, a fellow master sommelier, Jeff Cruz, said no one is ever born a gifted samurai sword maker. It takes years and years and years and years of practice to become a great samurai sword maker. Why would we expect people to be naturally gifted at something like wine? 
It's the same kind of thing. It takes time, it takes evolution, it takes training. It takes a lot of drinking it, which is usually a good thing. The more you taste wine, the more you experience wine, the better you get at it. Um, and it's one of those great things that, um, you know, again, you, you're going to stop and smell the roses, literally, from here on out, because you want to really understand better what a rose smells like. You want to understand better what peach smells like. We all know what, I mean, we have, we have you know, candles that sell, you know, lemon fresh is the one thing that I always, I always laugh at because we assume we know what lemon is because we get this chemical kind of composition of what lemon is and we smell lemon. Okay, but have we ever stopped and smelled freshly grated lemon zest? Freshly squeezed lemon, lemon pie, lemon curd, lemon custard, Meyer lemon versus a, a traditional lemon. I mean, think about all these iterations and all these different things we can smell. We can smell thousands and thousands of things. But do we really actually stop and smell them and, and take notice of them? That's the, that's the challenge for all of you. Uh, as you. As you kind of exit this room at the end of the night is to you know, pay a little bit more attention to what we're smelling, what we're drinking, what we're enjoying. That's half the fun of exploration. So for the first wine, what do we smell? This is where we get a little bit more participation here. What do we smell in this wine? Grape, grapefruit? Green apple, grapefruit. Pineapple. Anything else? Fairly aromatic, right? I mean, I can smell this wine just, and I have a, I have a fan here trying to keep me from sweating profusely, um, but I, have a, I, I can smell this glass, you know, not even sticking my nose into it. It just jumps out of the glass for me. It's very effusive, very lively, very jubilant wine, if you will. So anything else is popping out here? Lemon. Lemon. Springtime in Germany. I don't even know what that means, but I love it. Peach. Peach. See, it, it's amazing. You stick your nose in, all of a sudden other things start popping up. It's like, oh, and then you start to remember flavor memories from when you were a child or when you're um, at, uh, you know, at a friend's house or you know, your grandmother's house. All these things start flooding back to you once you start to unlock this kind of hidden language of what wine's all about. It's really about memory. How do we, how do we know what a lemon smells like? Well, we remember it. We think about it. We spend some time embracing it, and then it becomes part of our flavor memory. It becomes part of our, our language when we start to enjoy wine. Take a sip. What do we taste? Does it taste the same? Does it taste different? Yeah, from the smell. Yeah, sorry. Same or different from the smell? Different. You get, you, get, you get a little bit of vanilla. You get a little bit of kind of a, you know, kind of a, a more kind of robust, uh, rounder profile. Absolutely. A lot of acid. Anyone feel like their mouth is watering? Yeah, you kind of, you, it's, it's a wonderful feeling because that's, that's basically this wine acting like windshield wipers on our palate. Acid helps to cleanse your palate. Acid is, it sounds like a bad thing. We talk about high acid wines. We talk about acidi acidity in wine. It sounds really bad. Um, but it's great because this is what keeps our mouth fresh. This is why you can pair up high acid wines with rich foods. One of my favorite things in the world is champagne and french fries. Why? French fries are rich, they're oily, they're greasy, they're delicious and salty. What's champagne? High in acid. All of a sudden you have one of the highest acid wines on the planet with one of the richest foods on the planet. I'm happy. It's deli I encourage all of you to try it. Go out to a nice restaurant, order a great bottle of champagne and french fries. <laughs> it, McDonald's drive through too. Don't drink and drive. Um, but, you know, yeah, again. Yeah, take Uber, that's fine. Have the Uber pull up. Uh, go through the McDonald's drive through with a glass of champagne. Um, it's amazing when you start to pay attention physiologically what wine can do to you, aside from make you feel, feel good. Um, it actually affects other parts of your body. And I want you to contrast that with wine number two, which is the Chateau Fusal, which is from 2006. This has a little bit more aging. This is a balance of 50-50 Sauvignon Blanc Semillon, but there's 50% new oak on this. So we go back to this slide a little bit. Full disclosure, wine number one, the Chateau Bonnet, had no oak whatsoever. Stainless steel meant to be fresh, crisp, clean as a daisy. This second wine, Chateau Fusal, sits in barrel. Going to get a little bit of maturity. New oak as well. So when we stick our nose in this glass, what are we smelling? Honey, buttery. Yeah, oak. I wanted to find oak a little bit more. You said oak. What gives you that idea of oak? I was told you ask all the questions. Yeah, butter, vanilla, you know, things like caramel, toasted bread. Like what's that? 
pear, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. There's, there's a lot of tree fruit, pears and apples, um, you know, quince, you know, Asian pear, things like that. You know, added semillon and then barrel aging. There's also something called lees contact, which takes place, which I didn't mention on the previous slide, because again, you go down, far down the rabbit hole of winemaking, you can unlock a whole, a whole bunch of different doors. But there's this toasty, almondy, walnut, hazelnut, something that gives you almost like a fresh baked brioche. And what happens is they just let the yeast, after fermentation, settle on the bottom in the barrel and just stir it up and gives it that kind of rich, toasty flavor. Added complexity. This is why white Bordeaux, quality white Bordeaux, aged white Bordeaux, is some of the most underrated white wines in the world. Maybe not in this room, but, in the, but out there in the wine world. Because people often associate Bordeaux with only red wines. One of the biggest challenges as a sommelier was to get people to even approach white Bordeaux. Because when we taste this, and taste this wine, you maintain a lot of that acidity. Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon bring to the table, but now you start to get a fuller, waxier, more you know, kind of creamier style of wine, but yet still really clean and precise. It's incredibly hard to do this without that perfect confluence of weather and winemaking technique and almost a little bit of luck.